Well, um, hello everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Um, thanks, Mike, for the last introduction. So, um, just wanted to give uh, a overview and some provide some research update for some major small fruit um, diseases. So, I'll start with uh, uh, grapes. So, anybody growing grapes here? Oh, quite a few. That's that's great. So, um, this is just a list of uh, major grape diseases, right? When it comes to grapes, I'm I, I'm sure that you know, you, downy mildew, powder mildew, those are well-known grape diseases. Um, so in this list, most of those diseases are, as you noticed, are caused by fungi, except for downy mildew, which is an omicid disease, right? Downy mildew, I think, probably is one of the most important diseases in our region that everybody has. Uh, powder mildew, uh, so far, has not been a major concern, and but it is a big problem in California um, where the weather tends to be drier. And uh, Formophthis, black rot, those are a uh, pretty big issue early in the season. And uh, I'd like to focus more on late season bunch rots. And late season bunch rots actually is a term that describe different diseases that occur later in the season. So, um, well, it has been uh, considered as a major threat in our region. And you probably say grapes like this, right? And also like that. And a lot of them are not easy to identify, to figure out what exactly caused the issue. But you probably guess there are multiple organisms involved as the symptoms, they look different. And you're absolutely right. After incubation in the lab for a few days, and you say grapes like this. And you can see the spiralation from different fungi uh, on the same, in the same cluster. So um, it's, it's a pretty, I mean, this, this issue is pretty frustrating. We, know, we all know how much effort are involved in vineyards. And when it finally gets to the point of harvesting, and this issue shows up, and which make the tremendous effort made seasonal almost for nothing. Um, so uh, to address this, we, uh, in the past two years, we connected the samples of laces and bunch rots from different vineyards, and we identify uh, the isolates to different species. As you can see, the Botrytis and the Cototrican being the major um, species um, associated with laces and bunch rots. However, um, those are our, there are our, uh, other species uh, that are that were pre pretty frequently isolated from this in a bunch of rats, including Pesto, Teopsis, Aspergillus, as well as Atenaria species. Um, so uh, according to some uh, literature, those fungal species are considered secondary um, invaders, secondary pathogens, which means uh, they are not capable of infecting, initiating infections uh, by themselves. And so to confirm, so we, so we uh, had a trial last year to confirm their pathogenicity under field conditions of those secondary invaders. And we were also, we were also wondering is there differences in cultivar susceptibility? And does the pathogenicity vary at different growth stages, as well as is wounding necessary for, um, for disease? Uh, so what we did, uh, basically we prepared uh, the spore suspension as inoculant uh, under lab conditions. And then in the field, we inoculate um, the grapes with the spore suspensions dif uh, from different fungi and respectively. So we basically, we did this at three different development stages um, at bloom, variation, and the pre-harvest. Right? And for each, different, for each stage, we had the two treatments. Um, wounding and long wounding. So we first inoculated the berries with the spores suspension, and then we wait until pre-harvest to injure the fruit and to see if the wounding would facilitate the infection. And similarly, we did this at variation and pre-harvest. And this was done with four different cultivars and uh, with those three um, uh, fungi. And this is what we got. And you can say those are three different um, fungi, right? And the X axis, the figure looks a little busy, but 
The x-axis shows different development stages, bloom, variation, and pre-harvest. Remember, each stage has two, had two treatments, non-wounding and wounding, right? Overall, you can say that the wounding treatment at pre-harvest resulted in higher disease severity compared to other treatments. And what's interesting is that um, at the variation, um, even for the wounding treatment, there was not much disease, except for aspergillus. Okay, so just uh, just want to switch to a different uh, fungal pathogen called called Tautricum. and this one is um, um, is well known um, causing bitter rot, like a carry Peter just mentioned on on apples, right, and causing anthracnose on strawberries, as well as ripe rot on grapes. And when it comes to uh, grapes, the infection timing of this fungal pathogen has not been well uh, studied. So we had a trial last year to try to identify the infection timing of this fungal pathogen. So this was done at a commercial vineyard and we used a protective fruit protective bag to keep the um, uh, clusters from infections, right? And we bag them at a different time. At bloom, baby size, pea size, berry touch, variation, and pre-harvest. And then we assessed the disease severity or harvest to try to uh, see if there's any difference in terms of disease severity between different treatments and hopefully uh, identify uh, the timing of infection. And in, in addition, we also had a spore traps set up in the field to capture the spores in the field and to hopefully correlate with the disease severity uh, from the bagging trial. So this is the data. This was done with two cultivars, um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. They ripened differently uh, at different time. And you can say the pre-harvest treatment resulted in higher disease severity than other treatments early in the season, right? Uh, there was no, not much difference in terms of disease severity between the treatments from bloom to variation. And uh, this might indicate that the control efforts uh, targeting uh, ripe rot, uh, I mean, maybe after variation, it's a better time to control ripe rot than early season um, control management. So, uh, just to make a conclusion, um, those three fungi, they seem to be all pathogenic when wounding occurs. Now, wounding occurs at variation, resulting in the few infection of Atenaria and the Pestotiopsis. Aspergillus seems to be most pathogenic of all the three fungi. Now, Chardonnay uh, was the most susceptible cultivar to Atenaria and Aspergillus, and our preliminary data that suggests the infection may rather occur later in the season. Uh, that's for the ripe rot called Tautrican uh, timing trial. And uh, however, we only did this for one year, and so we're going to repeat it this year to hopefully get some uh, consistent data. And the last one, fungicide sprays for this is bunch rots. Between baby size to variation may not be necessary, okay? So, for example, for botrytis, uh, the current uh, strategy is to, uh, to spray at the bloom, at uh, um, berry touch, at a variation, right? So you've got a different uh, development stages to control for botrytis, for example. But, um, um, uh, but with the data from the pathogenicity trial and the data from the crotaltric and timing trial, we think that the fungicide sprays for this and bunch of rot between a few weeks after bloom until variation, this time period may not be necessary. But again, this is just from based on our preliminary data and we're going to validate this again this year. And, and I want to switch to strawberry anthracolos. Um, in my understanding, strawberry anthracolos has been an increasing issue for most of our growers um, in the region. Now, it's generally, generally this disease considered warm disease that occur later in the season. However, under highly uh, favorable conditions, the disease can occur, the infection can occur much early in the season on the flowers and even shows up on the green fruit. And um, the pathogen is also uh, capable of infecting the crown, the root causing the anthracolous crown rot. Now the symptoms sometimes can be confused with other crown rot issues such as phytophthora, black root rot complex. So those are uh, pretty uh, um, con uh, confusing. 
Um, so where does it come from and how it spreads in terms of um, you know, the, the passaging, right? So it's believed that the collidia of cototrican species are usually produced on the host tissue and are typically rain splash dispersed. On no growing crops such as strawberries, collidia are spread over short distances. So possible source of infection, nursery transplants. In fact, the cototrican species have both biotrophic and, and the lacrotrophic stages. So the symptom may not show up for some time due to the biotrophic stage, right? But soon after planting in the fruiting field, uh, the collidiation can occur in the vegetative tissue and when the weather conditions are favorable and this can serve as inoculant to infect flowers and the fl uh, fruit later in the season. So, but uh, 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 be mindful that not all infected transplants will result in the disease. So this would depend on the level of inoculant in transplants. It depends on the cultivar susceptibility as well as the weather conditions. Um, so other possible source of infection, weeds, right? Cototrican has a wide range of hosts, including weeds. Uh, however, the fungi seem to live on weeds as an endophyte or remain latent, so which unlikely produce collidia that are needed for dispersal. And even collidia are available from, from other hosts. They're limited in distances that they can spread as a water splashing passenger. And survivals in the soil, this also uh, is a possible source of infection. And it's, the passenger is not a typically a, is not a typical soil-borne passenger, but can survive in the soil for up to 12 months um, when um, um, under dry conditions. So survival of Chalidia and Sclerotitia declined rap rapidly under moisture conditions. And there have been some studies that showed at 11% 11 soil, 11 soil moisture content, the time required for 95 loss of viability was 70 to 75 days. So if, if the soil at field capacity 22% uh, moisture and the same level of reduction in the population recorded within four to 10 days. So it depends on the soil moisture content, right? If you have a drier soil, then uh, you might consider this possible uh, source of in, uh, infection. Um, control of strawberry and thracolose, chemical control has been a major uh, method for strawberry and thracolose management. Now, strawberry lurins fungicides, FRAC11, and are the most effective, but resistance has been a big concern and has been reported in the Southeast. Uh, as a matter of fact, we also detected resistance to this chemical group uh, from the, I mean, in the isolates from our region, uh, from Maryland and uh, uh, Virginia, as well as Pennsylvania. We had about 30% of isolates uh, that are resistant to strawberry lurins. Um, FRAC, FRAC1, Topsin M, this, this group is effective only against Cototric uh, and Galodius varieties. Uh, based on the isolates we collected, most of them are Cototric and Accutated, not this Galodius varieties. And even uh, for the isolates within Galodius varieties, some of them, some of them have developed the resistance to Topsin M. So Topsin M probably it's not gonna do anything for anthracos control at this point. And other fungicides such as Captain and Switch are effective to some extent. They're not as effective as strobulurins if resistance is not a concern because Captain and Switch, they uh, do not have a strong um, um, uh, systemic activity. And, and other cultural-based uh, control methods, including sanitation of infected plants and the fruit. Uh, however, there have been a few studies that showed this method might not be effective. Also, it's quite a labor intensive, right? May not really be economically uh, uh, feasible. And the living mulches or organic mulches, they're likely effective, increasing plant density. Well, this also may be, like, uh, may be effective with increased plant density, basically um, it reduce the amount of water that penetrates plant canopy, thus reducing the overall amount of rain splash. 
and this passage is dispersed by rain splash, right? By rain splash. Uh, Anthracnose was found more severe, less severe, sorry, when water is supplied to plants using drip, and this is easy to understand. Okay, so are there any new or existing fungicides that may offer some efficacy for strawberry anthracnose? Now, those are the species we identified so far from the anthracnose isolates. Um, uh, again, we have two, we're dealing with two different species complexes, Clotochicin acutatin and Clotochicin gloriosporides. And under acutatin, uh, there are two species, Nymphaeae and the Fiorini. And under gluteal spread is uh, called Tochicin cyamense. And we have detected the resistance uh, in those two species to FRAC11. And this called Tochicin acutatin complex is naturally resistant to FRAC1, to Topsin M. And whereas gluteal spread is, we have found the resistance to both Strobilurins and the Topsin M. Um, so you can say either FRAC11 or FRAC1 will do much for anthracnose management. Um, so, um, we tested the sensitivity of our cotogen species to different FRAC3 fungicides. Uh, this group, I mean DMI fungicides, has not been used much in strawberry production. And uh, the reason that I'm interested in this group is that this group has very strong, um, has a strong systemic activity and also um, there have been some, uh, quite a few, a number of active ingredients within this chemical group that some, you know, somehow they, they vary in their efficacy for uh, different um, uh, fungal species con uh, control. So the X axis shows different active ingredients within this chemical group, and the y-axis shows the EC50 values. The higher the bars are, the less effective the fungicide would be. And clearly, propiconazole and defenconazole performed much better than other active ingredients within this same chemical group uh, for all those different cotogen species identified so far from strawberries. Okay, and the propiconazole, that's, um, uh, that's tilt. And definitely, though, that's um, 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 quadris top. Uh, in addition, we also tested the sensitivity of our, I mean, of um, the cotogen, different cotogen species to different active ingredients within SDHI fungicides, within FRAC7. So you can say, again, the, 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 the higher the numbers are, the less effective the fungicide would be. So you can say pencilpyrod and the benzovin, those are the, uh, probably um, uh, much more effective than other active ingredients within this group. Now, BOS stands for boscalid, that's pristine, right? Fluoxide peroxide, that's marivan. And pencilpyrod, that's fontalis, and the fluparin, that's lula, uh, lula series. And this one, benzovin, this has not been labeled for strawberries, but it will be labeled soon. Um, but it's, it's labeled on grapes, uh, the Aprovia. Okay, so take home message, resistance to QI, FRAC11 or FRAC1 is common. Use of these two fungicide classes may no longer be effective. And captain should be included in every sprays during fruit ripening, right? Again, the passaging is considered a warm passaging that likely occur later in the season during fruit ripening. Uh, the disease pressure is gen generally higher. You want to include the captain, which does not select for resistance. Uh, certain DMIs, tilt and the quadris top and the fontalis may be useful, okay? But their efficacy need to be validated under field condition. And avoid growing highly susceptible cultivars. Highly susceptible cultivars in open field conditions, any practices that can keep water or rain off from the, uh, of the plant will be, uh, will be uh, um, beneficial. So do not keep strawberries in uh, permanent crop areas, especially when soils are on the dry side. What? The last point, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Oh, so it's like a rotation. Oh, okay. Yeah, especially when the soils are on the dry side. I'm sorry, 
Okay, so at last I wanted to just touch briefly on, on some Bramble diseases. I just a brief overview of the disease and their management. So there, are, there is a number of uh, diseases uh, in Brambles, right? Fruit rots, foliar diseases, cam crown disease, and viral disease as well. Uh, botrytis is a common disease that goes on to different small fruits. And you can say that the spores are produced from the, the fruit and which will uh, be spread by, you know, by wind to other to infect other healthy uh, fruit during the same season. So we, we um, this this fungal fungal pathogen has tremendous ability to develop resistance to different active ingredients. Um, so we connected isolates from different small fruit, um, blackberry, raspberry, grape, strawberry, and we tested for resistance to different active ingredients. Right. So. Those are different active ingredients, and the y-axis is the frequency of resistance. And you can say uh, resistance has been uh, uh, was identified to to almost all those active ingredients tested. Um, the better ones are those: switch, Fontanis, Mirovos, um, Aprovia, Kenja. Those ones still uh, have much less resistance uh, issues compared to the others. Okay, so switch and other uh, SDHI, newer SDHI fungicides. So uh, late leaf rust. Um, so leaf rust, again, it's, first of all, it's not a systemic. It affects fruit and leaves, okay? And a certain spruce are alternative, alternative hosts, alternative hosts, but can persist without them. And it's more common on, uh, on four uh, cultivars, on the four uh, raspberries. And it can cause uh, premature uh, defoliation, resulting in unmarketable fruit. And uh, cultural control for uh, the leaf rust uh, do not pull the plants out because it's not um, it's not a systemic disease. You want to keep the plants and improve the airflow in tunnels, remove flowering cams, right? and avoid the planting near white spruce. That's, that would be an alternative host for this uh, fungal for this pathogen. And chemical control, uh, typically not needed, but FRAC3 and 11, DMI and strawberry lurins, those are uh, pretty effective. Uh, you want to include copper for resistance management. Now viral diseases. There was a survey conducted in Pennsylvania um, two years ago and to test for viruses virus in, in, Bramble, uh, in Brambles, you can say 54 tested po positive for a virus, many were wild. So the, the viruses, I mean, it's pretty common and it's very, I mean, it's commonly existed in wild Brambles. And in order of frequency, uh, there are different viruses have been uh, reported, okay? And management, well, you want to maximize the distance from wild Brambles or older plantings and the control low end vectors, such as F aphids in particular, and uh, threats, and watch for symptoms, remove plants. So at last, I wanted to uh, touch briefly on orange rust. And it's a problem um, for black purple raspberries, and some blackberry cultivars also got the, uh, get this issue as well. It is systemic, so it's different from um, um, leaf rust, which is not systemic. Now, bright orange spores in late spring, it has a very complex life cycle. Two spores types at different times of the year. Now, this is the life cycle of the, the disease. It looks very busy, very complicated, right? But I, I will try, try my best to, um, uh, to explain this. So let's say you have a plant infected with orange rust. Early in the spring, the new camps are spindly and leaves appear deformed and yellow. And later on, the sesha will uh, develop on the underside of the leaf, appear waxy at the first, and then turn bright orange. And sesha spores will uh, be released and dispersed by wind and splashing water. Okay, and uh, during, uh, during summer, in late May or early June, uh, the mature leaves will be infected by the acacia spores. And, and you can observe the dark and the brown uh, spots on the underside of the mature leaf. And from, from there, the, 
the teleospores will be uh, produced. Now, uh, at this point, teleospores will either germinate or not germinate. In case it germinates, it will continue to produce basidial spores that infect um, the rooting can, the buds of the, uh, the rooting can. Now the fungus become, uh, became uh, systemic, systemic. In case it doesn't germinate right away, it will overwinter in all the plant, in all the leaves, and in spring, uh, it will germinate to produce um, basidial spores that infects the new shoots from the crown. Then, then the fungus become, become systemic. Okay, so that's the whole cycle of the disease. But you, if you pay enough attention, you probably notice that there are two, um, you know, infection, the infection would happen two times in a season, during the same season, right? During spring and during fall. And so scouting is very important. And after leaves have just emerged in early spring, check new primal can growth for deformed yellow leaves and look for spindly clustered new shoots that develop from the crown. Infected cams will have few, if any, uh, spines. Search the underside of the leaves for waxy, blister-like uh, pistil, um, um, you know, um, pustules. And towards the end of May, search the underside of leaves for bright orange blisters. During summer, check the underside of the mature leaves for dark brown spots, uh, especially in the lower canopy and towards the um, middle of the trellis. And cultivar uh, red raspberries are resistant. Purple and the black raspberries are susceptible to, to this disease. And uh, we wanted to maximize this distance from wild bramble when planting, right? And chemical control, frog three and 11, those are the two ones that are effective if the disease has not been established. If the disease already established, these two chemical classes uh, will not do much, okay? And you want to apply those fungicides around the time of leaf emergency in early spring, three to six weeks in the fall. Remember, two, you know, infection happened two times, during fall and during spring. That's the time we should make effort to, to target the disease. And every, uh, you know, uh, about three to six weeks in the fall, extended moisture and the temperature between 75 to 70. So that's the, that's the favorable condition for the disease infection and spray every uh, 14 to 20 days. Uh, to make a summary, uh, scouting is critical for the orange rust management. And uh, the use of fungicides may not be sustainable because we only have two chemical classes, fungicides that are, that are effective and, and and if we want to spring, spray those fungicides at spring, during spring and during fall, it, you know, we probably will uh, spray them quite a few times in the season. So perhaps no need to spray if no sign of disease. Again, scouting is very important. Uh, I think that's all I have. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. On that last rest, um, no alternative, alternate host on that? Orangey rust? On the last rust. Hmm? No alternate host? Which rust? Orange. The bramble rust. The, no which orange. one? Leaf rust or orange rust? The orange rust. The orange rust. Orange rust, uh, yes. I mean, the, 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 um, the wild, wild brambles, that could be an alternative. Uh, uh, so it doesn't go to another species um, that we know? Well, it's because it's a systemic disease. Okay. It, it doesn't require another host to complete its life cycle. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. 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 For mopsis on blueberries? Uh, well, as far as I know, you know, in grapes, I know pruning really helps. You know, you want to do a Good job to print them out and followed by Mancozeb application. That would help. Uh, lime sulfur, sulfur. Lime sulfur? Dormant spray. Dormant spray, yeah, that has some efficacy to some extent. It's not a quite, it's not very effective, but it helps, yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, you said that uh, all red raspberries are resistant to the rust. To orange rust, yes. I had a variety I tested years ago called Jackal. You got it. 
Okay. 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 Maybe it's not uh, I don't know completely resistant, but it should be much better than than the purple and the black raspberries. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.